because there's so much interest in this paper that we talked about last time. Yeah. Uh, you know, the MSN and a few other sites at the end of the year, you know, they produce their review. And they've said things like this is one of the top six results in physics in the entire year. Wow. So yeah. I've been giving seminars and colloquia sometimes two a week. I mean, sometimes it was literally going from one city to the next for every two days and giving a colloquium at a university or a national lab or something. Yep. So it was good to come back home and actually have Christmas literally to me and my family without going someplace. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, well, that's, that's good. That has been like, and it's about to start up again. Next week I'm off. The week after I'm off again. So. Yep. <laughs> well. You have to, yeah, I mean, with, with things like that, I mean, you have to tell the world somehow. It needs to get out there in some way, right? So I guess yeah. makes sense. So this is, I mean, the media has already got it out there. Yep. Uh, this is where your physics department colleagues and other people from the university literally can spend time with you over the whole day. So we can have one-on-one -on -one meetings or we can go for lunch, dinner. And we literally talk about the details and exactly how it's done. Why is it better than other people? Right. What could be done by others in the future that you know would catch up or do better? Or what's my plan in the future? So uh, you know, just the news out there is one thing, but literally talking with the interesting people has a lot of value. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll have an episode dedicated to that, and we'll chat more. But let's let's shift to. The big yep. news in physics, of course, uh, why we're here in this special episode for nuclear, nuclear fusion. Um, let's, I guess you can start by, I would love to hear your um, explanation to the audience of kind sure. of what happened at uh, Lawrence, Livermore, Lawrence Livermore National Labs. And um, I don't know if you know anybody of the team there, but I would love to, if you, okay. Yeah, no. but give an example, give, give kind of a, okay line and and we can start there so, i don't know anybody at the national admission facility at the lawrence Livermore. we have very little overlap between what we do which is right much more fundamental science just you know secrets of the universe and something applied like they do there so what has happened what they make are little pellets of certain isotopes of hydrogen so i'll describe which particular isotopes you basically are trying to reproduce what happens either at the center of the sun, which is a natural process, right. or what happens at the center of a thermonuclear bomb. Those two processes are somewhat similar, quite a lot similar. The way you cause them to happen is different, but then once you've got that reaction going, it's almost the same. Right. So what exactly are we doing? Our goal, or their goal, is to compress hydrogen atoms. In particular, it's the nuclei of hydrogen atoms. If you compress them hard enough, they will eventually have nuclear fusion. So this is the big holy grail nuclear fusion, 50 years we're pursuing it. What happens there is basically E equals mc square from Einstein's theory of relativity. If you add up the total mass of the hydrogen nuclei that are going into the reaction, what comes out of the reaction is a helium nucleus and maybe a little debris and some neutron here or there. So add up the masses of everything that's going in, add up the masses of everything that's coming out, and you find that what's going in has more mass by some fraction of a percent. It's a tiny fraction of a percent, like maybe a few thousands, a few parts per thousand. Okay. If you take that mass difference and then do E equals mc square, you say, what happened to that mass? It got converted to energy. So when you take the mass of, of protons, take a few parts per thousand of that, convert that to energy, then for every few atoms that are fusing, it's quite a lot of energy. So if you convert that to a milligram of hydrogen or a gram of hydrogen or some tiny amount like this, 10 grams of hydrogen. If you do the math, you find it's a substantial amount of energy you're liberating by converting that few parts per thousand mass into energy. Yeah. So that's the goal. Now, why is it so difficult? It's because hydrogen atoms, the, the, the nuclei are protons. 
So protons are all positively charged, so they repel just by electrostatic. So you try to get these protons close together so that they can fuse. And of course, their electrical repulsion is getting stronger and stronger. Right? So, so they, they don't want to uh, stick together. So you, you got to push them hard. Right. So what do you do to push them hard? You have to heat up the stuff to a very high temperature, the kind of temperature that happens inside a thermonuclear weapon or at the center of the sun. Now, how do you heat things up to that high a temperature? You compress it. So you squeeze it really, really hard. Yeah. What the sun is doing is it's squeezing it with gravity. And that's why a star has to be that big. Its gravitational pull has to be so strong that the core is getting squeezed by an enormous weight. And that squeezing becomes strong enough that it starts overcoming the electrical repulsion of the protons, so they eventually fuse. Which is inefficient compared to what we're doing. Obviously, it's just it's just there's so much of the sun and atoms that it's destined to happen, and gravity kind of takes over. So nature does it with gravity. And the bigger the star is, the more gravity it has, so the fusion goes faster. So our sun is actually not by far any you know, biggest star. There are some stars that are 10 times bigger than the sun. Right. In those, the nuclear fusion is happening much, much faster because that much more gravity is squeezing. So we, we can't do that here. So what do we do? Right. What the National Ignition Facility is doing is it's blasting a tiny pellet of this hydrogen, a particular isotope of hydrogen, with lasers. So that's where the technology and the care and all of this, why they're taking you know years and years to get it right, eventually we got here, is that you're blasting it with 192 lasers. So you have this tiny pellet, you have this huge chamber, and all these lasers are pointing exactly at this little thing. Yeah. And exactly at the same time, they've got to zap this pellet from all directions equally right. with laser power. So this pellet feels the same force from all sides. So it doesn't actually go anywhere. It just sits there and gets compressed because of the energy being pumped onto its surface. Now, if you do it enough or blast it strongly enough, the compression becomes so large that the inside of the pellet becomes hot enough, like in a thermonuclear bomb or like at the center of the sun. So you achieve those conditions in this little pellet without gravity, but by basically blasting it from all sides to squeeze it in. So we're bla so photons, we're, we're blasting with photons. Yes. What really happens is the surface of the pellet evaporates, right? So you're blasting it with a lot of power, all sides. Yeah. The yeah. surface evaporates. It becomes a gas, it becomes an extremely hot gas. Yep. So the extreme hot gas is blasting outwards. It's like you've surrounded the little pellet with explosives yeah. and, and set it off. You don't actually need explosives. You just blast it with lasers and the thing evaporates very, very quickly. So by momentum conservation, when the gas on the surface is blasting outwards, it's like a rocket pushing all sides of the pellet inwards. And so the trick is you have to do it extremely symmetrically. If you do it a little bit more on one side than the other, then instead of getting squeezed, it will just shoot off to one side, like a rocket strapped on one end. So what do you imagine is 192 rockets blasting outwards on all sides. So this thing has nowhere to go but gets compressed. Right. Then you got to do the math and get it compressed so hard that the inner part of the ball becomes hundreds of millions of degrees. And so that's exactly what happens. That's the temperature you need to create fusion. That's when the protons are moving so fast. So that's what temperature is. Temperature means how fast are the things moving. So at some temperature like that, tens of millions of degrees, the protons are moving fast enough that when two of them come towards each other, their speed is bigger than their repulsion. So their electrostatic repulsion gets overcome. It's like a spring you're trying to squeeze. If you squeeze it softly, you won't get it to be small enough. You've got to come in really fast. And so then you compress it hard enough. Then they get really close together, and then the fusion happens. So this is has been happening for a while. 
So what, what's the breakthrough this time? The breakthrough is you calculate how much energy was produced by this pellet when the fusion occurred. Right? So you make all the measurements and you compute. It's something like 3 million joules. Okay. So what's 3 million joules? If you take an iron, you know, the one you use to press your clothes, if you run an iron for about 15 minutes, it's going to consume something like 3 million joules. So that's the scale of the energy put out by one of these pellets. Oh, sorry, 2 million. Uh, 3 million, 3 million. It's the right number. So what's the breakthrough? The breakthrough is how much laser energy did you put in to create the blast and the compression? Right. Historically, that was always more than the fusion energy that came out. So obviously, you're putting more energy in than the fusion energy coming out. So you haven't achieved breakthrough. The goal, the goal is not to change the output, but to change the input. Sort of. I okay. think they've been steadily improving both. Okay. How much you're producing. So do it even better. Do it just right. Right. So increase the output more and more. Right. But at the same time, do it in such a clever way that the laser power that you're putting in is less than the output energy. So what they got done this time, which is the breakthrough, is that they put about two megajoules in the laser power and three megajoules came out from the fusion. So three more than two, quite a bit, right? 50% yeah. more. Yeah. And so that's the breakthrough that you've actually exceeded energy out relative to energy in. So it's progress on both sides. Right. But that's a pretty interesting milestone. So that that's the big thing they've achieved after a lot of effort and yep. they have to get it just right. You know, you said that you, you do it once and you find out exactly how well it did. Then you analyze carefully the laser power and can you tune the lasers up a little bit? Can you change the pellet a little yep. bit? Do it again, do it again, do it again. And finally, you reach the breakthrough point. And how many years of research did it take to get to this point, would you say? I have to check when the national ignition facility was built right okay i think i've known it's been around for a couple of decades i'll have yeah. to check the exact date but by sense it's been around for a couple of decades maybe more yeah and there may have been a precursor which was smaller right so they made some advances learned a lot of the science on that one then they built this particular facility that they've been working with uh, I'm pretty sure it's around 20 years, maybe more, maybe less. Sure. What would you, I love it. And, and what would you say, because there's a lot of doubts with nuclear from people who know what they're talking about and a lot from people like me who don't know what they're talking about. But what, um, and I don't doubt it, but what would you say needs to go into this process? Um, it's so a horizon where everything's successful, everything's lucky, and we did it. And what, what what does it look like powering, say, just the United States through nuclear? Is that possible? And how far is that away, roughly? And like, what needs to go into that oh. more development for that to happen? So let's start small. Yeah, powering the U.S. or something is many, many, many steps down the line. For sure. sure. So let's start small. What's the next step? See, I carefully said the amount of laser power that went in was about 50% more than the fusion energy that came out. Okay? Now, what did I exactly mean by laser power? It's the power coming out of the lasers, which is actually hitting the pellet. That's what we are comparing to the fusion energy coming out. The next question is, well, the lasers don't work by themselves, right? You have to power the laser. So how much energy was put in to the laser in order to, for them to produce a laser beam? So the important thing here is that the two megajoules of laser energy that came out required about 300 megajoules of electrical power going in. Right. So if you look at it from a commercial standpoint, there, what is not so important is the laser power produced. It's how much do you have to extract from the wall, from the wall socket. Yeah. That is not two megajoules. That's 300 megajoules. Right? 
So okay. if you calculate it like this from a cost accountant's perspective, yeah, he that person would say, look, laser, I don't know all this. How much was the electricity bill right. to run one of these blasts? Yeah. And that's 300 megajoules worth of energy is what you took from the wall. And the pellet produced three megajoules. So the output energy is only 1% of the wall power that you used. So where's the catch, right? You, you look at the numbers, it's always in the numbers. And the catch is the lasers are not so efficient. So while we are achieving breakthrough in the fusion itself, right. the trick to create the fusion process here was the lasers. So you got to factor in the efficiency of the lasers. And yeah. the laser efficiency is only about 1%. And these are extreme high power lasers, very well aligned, you know, very carefully built and all of this. Yeah. So your next step is going to be asking the question, what would it take the lasers to go from 1% efficiency, which means wall power to laser power output, to something like 80% efficiency, which is what you would need for this to become a commercially viable thing. Yeah. Now, why do we think we are talking about this national exhibition facility for 20 years? Why are these scientists doing this thing once a week, twice a week for this long? Yeah. Making these high power lasers more efficient is not easy. Creating more efficient lasers is not an easy technological problem. It's got fundamental physics limitations. It's got technological limitations, it's got material science issues going in there. So there are many ways to blast a laser. You basically have to pump a lot of energy into this material, whatever the laser material is. And some small fraction of it becomes the laser light. So you can do all the math carefully, which is what the experts are doing and saying, how yeah. can we get more of that input energy come out as laser light? and not just as heat and all kinds of other things, right? A lot of catch, catches there that you have to resolve. So this is where we have to ask laser experts, and I'm not a laser expert, but I would say that increasing laser efficiency by another factor of 10, 20, 30, which is what is going to be needed. Yeah is a very hard problem. There are laser experts all around the world, not just at the National Exhibition Facility, but you know, lasers are everywhere. Totally. Uh, I, I'm sure the Defense Department has talked about using lasers as some kind of <laughs> you know, shooting down missiles. Uh, national oh, they are. Oh, they are, yeah. So everybody cares about laser efficiency one way or the other for various different reasons. The progress here, my sense is, and this is where you know we should talk to some experts, is that this is not easy. Progress is slow. Um, if even if they were to double the efficiency of these lasers, it would go from one percent to two percent, and they're trying to get to eighty percent. Yeah. So my feeling is that the reason the National Ignition Facility has been doing this is not because everybody is betting that this laser technique is the way to make it commercially viable. Right? So they want to factorize the problem into, given that we are having the best lasers we can make, can we actually induce fusion in this way? Can the fusion process itself be more energy out than in? Forget the laser problem. Okay, yeah. so that's a milestone in itself. Right. If that is achieved, somebody can go, you know, launch a laser research program. I'm sure it's been happening already. Yeah. And you can investigate what further can be done with the lasers. Yeah. So until this issue is sort of has substantial, really, orders, like factor of 10, factor of 50 improvement in laser power, laser efficiency, we are not going to talk about this particular result as a way to solve the energy crisis. So let the scientists work on the laser power issue. Let there be a major breakthrough in laser efficiency 
well by some factor and then we start saying okay we had a factor of 50 to improve we've done a factor of four or three or whenever another factor of five to go another factor of three to go and at that point, we start saying, OK, you have actually an entire process from wall power to fusion power output, which is generating more energy than in. And now we are getting somewhere to actually producing a commercial prototype, something like this. So I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that this is the way we get to commercial fusion power. Does it need to be lasers? my guess from the physics i know is that you have to deliver that punch to the surface of this hydrogen pellet yeah very quickly right so that it blasts with a very high velocity and right. that's what's creating this very high compression very rapid compression otherwise the pellet will just break up and it, it won't sit there to collapse right so to my knowledge, lasers are the only way I can think of that yeah, can pump that much power or that much energy that quickly and also in a very small area, right? Remember, the pellet is tiny, so you have to pack that much power on a tiny, tiny surface. Literally, the pellet is a few millimeters or something like this. Right. And you got to blast it from 192 sides or 200, something like this. I don't know how else, I can't think of any other way you can do it other than lasers, which is why they've been investing 20, 30 years in making this thing trigger with lasers. Yeah. Um, now, this is public knowledge, so I don't mind saying it. You can ask, well, how does a thermonuclear weapon do it? We've had hydrogen bombs for 70 years. You got to blast it high with a lot of force and collapse it on the inside the same way. The way it's done there is you put a uranium or plutonium bomb, a, tip, a standard atomic bomb, which is a fission device. You surround the hydrogen bomb with a standard atomic bomb. And when you do that just right, it's the atom bomb that goes on on the outside. Yeah. And that's the one that's compressing the hydrogen on the inside to the same temperatures as the center of the sun. So you've got to create extreme heat, extreme energy, extreme pressures somehow outside the hydrogen to squeeze it. So the sun does it with gravity. Great. You can't do that. The only two other ways we've done it is an atom bomb, which is obviously not a commercial way of doing it, right? <laughs> Uh, to squeeze the inside, become a hydrogen bomb. Right. And the third one is the tokamak method. So it's the tokamak method that many other commercial enterprises and ITER and the Princeton Plasma Lab and so many other places have been doing for 30, 40 years. So the magnetic confinement is the third way of doing it. And I don't know of any others. So as you know, the, the, few, the tokamak process, the magnetic confinement process is also being investigated for, I think, as long as I've been studying physics, which is probably 40 years. Wow. OK. Yeah. Not, not so many other ways you can squeeze things no. that hard quickly to create that kind of temperature. And you have to hold it there, right? You have to hold it there for long enough for enough of the hydrogen nuclei to actually fuse. Yeah. So if it's too short a time, maybe a, some tiny number of the protons will fuse, but the rest of them will dissipate away, so no good. Right. You have to create a milligram or a gram or something, you know, that's yeah. commercially viable. So, you know, we've talked about fusion for decades. And when you start seeing what's the thing you need to do, we know how the fusion happens. It's just that the conditions required for fusion are not easy to create. So we, we talked about the ignition process and um, how, how that's structured. What, what happens after 
the actual energy output in fusion. Um, and I guess we can draw from fission and heating up water and steam and all that stuff. Uh, you know, we I guess we can go over that. That's typically how it's done. Yeah. So even what happens in a nuclear reactor or a bomb or the sun, all that energy rattles all the protons around, right? So they're all coming out with lots and lots of velocity, lots and lots of energy, and which means temperature. So the whole thing obviously gets hot to many, many tens of millions of degrees because of the fusion energy output. Um, and typically, you just surround it with something that will absorb the heat. And there are so many different things people try. I mean, water is the most common thing. But I, I've, I know there are reactor designs that use molten salt. There's some reason to use molten salt. Hmm. I know of a reactor design that use molten sodium. So I think there are reasons why those molten materials are better to convert the heat energy into you know, steam and eventually you turn a turbine. In the end, that's all you do. You yeah. convert the heat energy into steam and turbines. But to transport the heat away, some of these molten materials are a more efficient way from the thermodynamics perspective than water. But of course, technologically, the challenge is, I mean, molten sodium is an extremely reactive thing. Right. So the chance of just a chemical problem or molten salt is an extremely corrosive reactive thing. So imagine pipes running molten salt through them at hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit. Things could go wrong, harder to material science, so a lot of the challenges are not just the fundamental physics, but what type of material can you use that will withstand that kind of temperature, that will withstand the corrosive nature of whatever you're using to extract the heat, that will withstand the radiation damage. Remember, this, this is all producing lots of neutron radiation. Yeah. So any material suffers radiation damage. This material has to not disintegrate under right. radiation damage. So what happens to metals, right? Typical metals, as far as I understand, start to become brittle. So they can crack, they can leak. So you got to find just the right material, which is not going to do that and man maintain structural integrity and you know, can't have water leaking or stuff like this. So, so typically in this fusion process, what is carrying the heat out is neutrons. So when the fusion happens, what is popping out of there is high energy neutrons. Yeah. And when neutrons collide with uh, the nuclei of our other atoms, they basically start dislodging them, hitting them this way, that way. So what you call crystal structure or things that give strength to the metal or the ceramic or whatever else is containing all of this, this reactor vessel, that thing starts to suffer structural damage, just radiation damage. So You've got to contend with that. How long is that thing going to last before you replace the vessel? Or you don't want to be replacing these things every day or every week or every month. Hopefully, it's going to run for years. So even the tokamak design has to deal with that. There, they make a hot gas, very, very tens of millions of degrees hot gas of hydrogen isotopes. And the energy is going to come out in the form of neutrons from the helium fusion. Right. And these neutrons are going to start bombarding your walls, and that's why they get hot. And so you're going to extract the heat from the walls. But you're getting the heat by neutron bombardment. So automatically, sure. the more heat you want to extract, the more radiation damage is happening at the same time. Yep. So something's going to withstand all the radiation damage. <laughs> so lots of challenges. Yeah. Uh, one at a time, people are solving. So that's why I mentioned, you know, 10 minutes ago, what are the advantages over other things? The amount of material you are fusing is much smaller than the amount of carbon you have to burn by a factor of a million. Right? So we are talking huge factors. Imagine one ton of carbon, oil, coal, something being burned, a huge amount of carbon. Compared to that, 
some tiny amount of hydrogen. Yeah. So million times less fuel. Radioactive waste with fusion, I believe, is much less. You have to worry about the radiation damage and what that is doing to your material. So your regular material can, will become radioactive because of all the neutrons hitting it. So you have to deal with that. But it's all contained. You, you can study the physics. You know how to deal with it. Um, ultimately, if you do it right and we figure it out, it's much cleaner. Well, okay. so infinite amount of fuel because you know we can't just use hydrogen and water. You got to use heavy water, so it's deuterium. So that's a proton and a neutron stuck together. Yeah. So a few parts per, I think it's one part per 6,000 or something of natural hydrogen is deuterium. So not so difficult. One part per 6,000 is quite a bit. So there's plenty of deuterium. The other isotope you need is tritium. So tritium is one hydrogen and two neutrons stuck together. Now that doesn't occur in nature. So there's a bunch of stuff you have to do to actually make tritium. So not easy, right? People say the fuel is readily available, almost. The deuterium is readily available, but the tritium has to be made. Well, to power the lasers, we're using coal, like you mentioned, at the end of the day. Or wind power, solar power, nuclear, right. or so, something, yes. That's, that's another thing. If we are utilizing fossil fuels to even do this, how can this be the energy of the future <laughs> because that runs out so we need to figure out this the solar power or wind power issue kind of first before yes. we think about the infinite nuclear fuel you know correct so that may be so i don't you know we shouldn't predict what cannot be done in the future because we have always done we humanity has solved problems right so this laser efficiency problem may get solved let's just leave that to the experts to comment on yeah Assuming there is a wall power to fusion power ratio, honestly computed yeah. uh, for in the commercial sense, which is more than one. So you're getting more useful energy out than energy in. Then you don't need nuclear fission or wind or solar. Because this reactor itself, after solving all these challenges, mind you, right? So right. lots of those challenges. But if the whole thing is commercially viable, what does that mean? It means the usable energy out of such a reactor will be more than the wall power that it uses. So I then you don't need wind, you don't need solar, you don't need anything else. OK. so. Uh, nuclear will be powering nuclear. Yes. Yeah, chain reaction over yes. time. Not... Yes. Okay. Yes. It's fusion powering fusion. Yeah. That's it's the goal. Principle. That's the goal. That's the goal. Okay. So you got to factor in every factor. Like if you produce heat, how much of the heat gets converted to electricity? Right. Which is also not a 100% efficient process, probably 40% efficient or something. So you got to it's just math, right? Multiply out all the factors. Yeah. Fusion energy out times the efficiency factor to convert to electricity. Okay, forty percent of that becomes electricity. You take this electricity, feed it back into the way that you're running your fusion reactor, or you know, with lasers or yeah. magnetic heating, whatever. There is an efficiency of that process. Multiply out all the efficiencies. You still need to be more than one. Right. Right. Then and only then the whole thing is an actual source of energy. Right. And it's been marketed, this breakthrough has been marketed not by the researchers. I'm sure the researchers are annoyed, but the press has said it's net energy gain, which you're outlining. No, it's not, it's not true. Like if we're taking every part of the cycle, it's not yep. net. It's not yep. net. So it all, I mean, a true statement is a statement where you define what you're doing. Yeah. And if you define it completely and not just give the half truth, it is true that it's net. But you have to be careful when you say net as to what are you dividing by? What's your denominator? What's the numerator? The numerator is the energy produced by the pellet, not 
how much of it is converted to electricity, right? Not all of it is going to get converted to electricity, just the heat coming from the pellet. Yeah, and cool. what went in was not the wall power, it was the laser power hitting the pellet. And that's what they're defining as net, and that's why everybody's happy and gleeful. But we can't, it's not something that we can act on now as, as humanity and then make things Correct. happen. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So I, I would say the scientists, you know, did report it exactly as they did. They of said course. the full truth. Yeah. But then it propagated through and it became, you know, people forgot what the net meant. Right. right. <laughs> exactly. So if you misinterpret the denominator, it sounds like it's a net source of energy. But right now it's a factor of 100 roughly away from that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. Okay. yeah, no, that was a good explanation. Um, we can wrap it with like, I guess let's go over solar. And okay. I'm very curious to see, cause um, you're a proponent of, of solar when last time we chatted and you understand yeah. solar. And do you think solar, we should still chase solar or do you think we should chase both of them in parallel? I guess like in 50 years, what do you see the US particularly being powered by most nuclear or solar is like a mix of some sort? Mix. All the people I've ever talked to, so I'm not in this field, but you know, I interact with experts, you go to yeah. conferences, you meet people who are working in this, who've been thinking about this for a long time. It's clear that it will have to be a mix. Yeah. And one very simple reason for mix is wind and solar are certainly day and night dependent. People are working on a potential solution to that. Yeah. But even more, of a challenge is that it's seasonal. Winter versus summer can have substantial differences in the amount of solar and wind you get. You know, weather patterns change. Clearly there's more solar somewhere in the summer than in the winter. Right. So our consumption pattern on the other hand is fairly uniform. You know, all of us need roughly the same life for summer and winter, day and night. Day and night may be a little better. Maybe you don't use as much power at night. Okay, people have to work this out. But if anything, it's possible that winter needs more power than summer. It all depends where you're living because some places require heating. Now, how are we going to do heating in the carbon-free world? We are not going to burn natural gas. So how are we going to do heating? Right. A lot of the world lives with three, four months serious heating. It's a big issue in Europe right now. Then in other places, you need cooling in the summer, right? We need all need air conditioning. There's a lot of power. So most people I've talked to say that something other than solar or wind at a pretty substantial level is going to be needed to even out the seasonal variation. So I, I asked, you know, what does substantial mean? What fraction of non-solar, non-wind are we talking about? At least one number that one expert told me was the U.S. should need about 40% of all energy generation, all electricity. They're talking of all electricity because transportation is going to be electricity. That's the future. Uh, heating, hopefully, is not natural gas. So what else would you do but electricity eventually? Um, industrial usage is mostly electrical already, but you know, we've got to make that electricity with non-carbon. So, so let's say electricity. The U.S. is about 20% electricity right now. And a lot of heating is not done with electricity. A lot of transportation is not done by electricity. So there are two numbers here. The electrical fraction today is nuclear is 20%. But electricity is not all energy. There is yet another energy, which is transportation, heating, which is mostly car fossil fuels. So you, it's an even bigger number out there. Ultimately, we've got to convert all of the energy, not just electricity, to electricity. <laughs> and then we want roughly 40% of all energy to be nuclear. So that's a big increase in nuclear. We're talking 20% of electricity which may only be one third of all energy to 40% of all. Okay. So I think we're talking something like five to maybe 10 times nuclear, 
more. Yeah. And of course, remember, total energy usage is also growing. You can talk about today, but 50 years from now, everybody's going to need some factor more energy than today. People go. So we are talking a factor of 10 more nuclear, just so that we have a sustainable system that handles uh, variations from anything, right? Wind, wind is fairly stable. You're going to build wind turbines only in those places, certain offshore regions, certain land regions where the wind patterns are stable. Wind patterns tend to be a little more stable uh, uh, day and night. Clearly, solar is gone in the night. Um, but there's a limit to how many wind turbines you can do, the limits to number of places you can build. So I think the bottom line is nuclear will have to be a much, much bigger part of the mix. Now, at the moment, the technology that we have is fission, just uranium and the usual stuff. I should say there's a lot of work going on on how to make those processes less reliant on particular uranium mining regions. Um, for example, I know that India is thinking of a different material called thorium. So India is a huge country, lots of people, doesn't want to be burning all its coal for the next 100 years. Uh, what to do? So nuclear is an option being investigated there. and. Um, India doesn't have uranium deposits. They happen to have only some place in the world. Yeah. So India has thorium deposits. So there's a kind of multi-generational processing, you know, nuclear processing process that the people have been working on for a while that could use thorium. Now, one of the tricky things there is you have to do reprocessing of fuel. And reprocessing always worries people because reprocessing is how you create the stuff that you need for nuclear weapons. Right. So proliferation is always the worry. Now, I, I think my, my, I mean, every time I learn more about these things, yeah. we just have to make choices. Yeah. It, it is not going to be like there is a magic bullet which will suddenly say I can have everything my way. You know. it, it is clear, I mean, I, I've seen evidence that global warming, for example, is literally killing coral reefs. 50% of the worldwide coral reefs are gone. Some places, 95% are gone. So coral reefs are crucial because even though the amount of biomass they represent in the ocean is absolutely tiny, it turns out that they are the natural nurseries. Yeah. Lots and lots of creatures lay their eggs and everything in the coral reefs. So the next generation of marine life, I've heard numbers varying between 25 and 40 percent. So between yeah, 25 and 40 percent of all marine life is born and the initial stages of its life before they go out into the open sea, self-sustaining, yeah. is in coral reefs. So coral reefs disappear, your nurseries are gone, and half of the marine life could disappear. They're being yeah bleached, and and that's just what we can visualize too. It's there, there yes. could be things that we don't understand in the natural world yes. that, we, that we don't even see or hear, and just our senses aren't picking up on. And who knows yes. what else? That's just the big one that's like in front of us, and that's why we're looking at that. But yeah, great. the destruction there is so widespread and visible, yep. you don't even know what else is happening somewhere that is not so visible. So that's one small example of the kind of impact. So we yep. are talking not just climate change, but the corresponding food insecurity. Food insecurity then creates, you know, people are discussing what kind of mass migrations might happen right. out of various regions. Right. Yeah, We've seen over the last few years, one million people, just one million people, compared to a continent of 300 million or something in Europe or something like that. Yeah. What kind of problems are created by 1% migration of the population, right? People are talking much, much, much bigger migrations might happen because of food insecurity triggered by water becoming scarce somewhere or all 
various things that climate can do. So there is no doubt the list goes on and on. We should can't. Yeah, and, and the big thing too is have to do like, something about burning fossil fuel. We just have to right. stop. And not only that, but like it just seems so antiquated. I just picture humanity being the a species who harnesses the power of the atom in a way where we don't need to <laughs> dig things out of the ground and burn it. And yeah. it just seems so antiquated. And if Correct. we really want to go forward in, in time and and innovation, we should think about that. But um, the other it's thing, kind of, like battery it's kind of obvious, right? That obvious nature captured this carbon hundreds of million years of years ago. Yep. So the amount of coal, oil, natural gas that we have today was a result of life on Earth with a cycle. Yeah. Uh, literally lasting hundreds of millions of, of years. Right. So all the carbon capture that the Earth did over, say, 100 million years is being released by us over a hundred years. So we are reversing the natural process by a factor of a million. Right. Clearly, the biological system on the earth is going to go out of balance Right. if a natural process is accelerated by not just a factor of 10 or 20 or 100, by a factor of a million. Right. So nature will respond. All of life on earth is going to change in some massive way yeah and we rely on everything else living on earth for us to live on earth uh, so these are the options so it, it seems just to wrap up that story we cannot avoid nuclear no matter how much we worry about it no yeah so yeah. let's turn the worry into more r d different kind of reactor designs people are discussing it people are discussing non-traditional reactor designs that cannot have a meltdown intrinsically in the technology there is a non-meltdown different physics we can discuss some other time beam induced uh, fission for example that simply cannot melt down that can also treat the radioactive waste so you don't have to worry about it for a thousand years right Everything has its potential risks, but I'll give one anecdote for our viewers. If you think of an aircraft, it is an extremely dangerous thing. It's got, I don't know how many thousands or tens of thousands of moving parts, big thing flying in the air, you know, things are not supposed to be flying. A couple of very well-trained people are in charge over there, the pilots. But you might say, my God, you know, think of this. This is a crazy way to travel. Anything could go wrong. Anything could go wrong and down you come. And there absolutely is no way to survive an aircraft crash. If you add up the number of miles people travel on the road and consider the casualties on the road, you add up the number of miles people travel in the air and the casualties from that, Air travel, which would seem like a vastly, vastly more dangerous thing to do, is actually, these are numbers, you can go research the numbers, is actually yeah. substantially more safe than taking a road trip. Yeah. Yeah. So, my God, that's completely mind-boggling, right? It's a mind-blowing statistic. Right. It's because everybody who builds an aircraft, maintains an aircraft, you know, flies the aircraft, you know, yeah. know this and they put so much effort into its safety yep. that it's safer to put 200 people on a plane than to put 200 people in a bus right because we we're at the whim of gravity in the plane which is a natural phenomenon objective and natural phenomenon but on the ground we're at the whim of other people which is yeah. not which is subjective it's not we don't know what's going to happen and this is exactly the argument you said it when we burn fossil fuel somewhere, so it's just me, just one little person somewhere here, there. <laughs> but all six billion of us are doing it. Yeah. Whereas in the, for example, the nuclear ways of, it's going to be some 1,000 people running a reactor, checking, rechecking carefully, just like the mechanics servicing the planes. You know, it's nine o'clock at night. 
there might be a freezing rain or something and the plane takes off and if you look out the window yeah. there are 10 people out there extremely well trained checking every single thing on the plane yep. and they fly the plane and yeah. when was the last time you heard of a plane crash we are investigating plane crashes from 200 from 20 years ago yeah right that's how rare these things are yep so that's what i think there is a a stigma in perception about nuclear but if we carefully study it get the information out tell people about what is being done all the experts are saying there is no other way to have a non-fossil fuel just because of the way the earth works with wind and solar so yeah. it seems like 40 to 60 percent wind solar somewhere in there is also hydro but hydro is limited right there is so much water flowing somewhere you, you can't pump it up by some factor yeah. so there are some dams and things like this but that's a minor thing yeah on the whole there's a lot of sun on the earth we have to think carefully about how to build the panels efficiently we don't want to create a lot of industrial waste yeah in the process of creating the panels and so on so just have to be honest about all that yeah so the wind turbines aren't free it, you need certain special metals right to create the turbines and people are talking about where are these things getting mined are the is the mining process safe is the labor involved in the mining done you know by proper codes probably not right now but we have to look yeah. into it so nothing is going to be free right uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch and it always will be true yeah but if you do it right there is a solution yeah and i'm, I'm thinking ten thousand years in the future i i don't there's there's a there's a finite number of coal for us to dig up and that's that's a fact it might be a lot but that's still a fact and so why not just start now researching how to utilize the power of the small particles and atoms and see how we can make them we hardly understand them now so why don't we just dive in and if we're already doing interesting things like what they're doing at that lab and coal is an accident of nature coal, yeah. coal happened because a bunch <laughs> of trees figured out how to grow and had a structure in their in their bodies called lignin which couldn't be digested by the fungus in the forest and so they didn't they didn't go anywhere they just they all fell down and toppled over each other over centuries yeah. Yeah. and then that compressed in the ground and that's yeah. coal and then of course fungus figured out how to eat the trees when they died yep. it's, it was an accident so that only happened once a long time ago way long time ago and there's a finite number and it's just it's just it's so obvious like you said that we need to think about nuclear yeah and the other statistics i will say the amount of coal that for example that we have burned so far compared to the amount of coal that is still in the ground the amount that is in the ground can last another 300 years Oh, I thought it was more than that. Yeah, so we maybe more than that. Maybe three hundred is the number I remember based on some known deposits, but there's probably more. So whatever damage we have done with coal, fossil fuels in general up to now, which is already so obvious. Right. If we burn the rest of it, I think I don't even want to say what catastrophe will happen. I mean, ten times worse than what we've already done. Yeah. And so there's no way to keep burning fossil fuel just, right uh, we just have to stop so so this is where nuclear comes in yep i think what we don't know i don't know um is is fusion a part of nuclear maybe it's worth trying now we know the technological challenge in the laser method yeah we've achieved one small grand success in one part of it we yep. need another grand success in the next part and the next part so yeah let's keep trying yeah we've had pretty good successes with nuclear there are better safer nuclear processes being investigated that are solving the challenges of the current processes safety wise fuel availability wise uh not having meltdown wise uh how to get rid of the waste at the right. same time as you produce energy right a lot of that has to do with 
accelerator beams that we use in particle physics. So that's why that's something I know a little bit about. Yeah. Um, to my knowledge, I believe China is investigating the beam induced methods. I think India is interested in investigating the beam induced method. I think it doesn't get talked about in the US much because in general, nuclear has a stigma in the US. So anytime you say a technology that will make nuclear safer, the word nuclear stands out and the rest of the sentence gets <laughs> abandoned. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so there is a perception here. And while we do the R&D, I think it's just good, like we are doing here, yeah. to talk about the fact that maybe the technology is actually much better than the perception. Right. And, the good... and people, people should ask, hey, so there was a Chernobyl. You got to tell us exactly what failed then. Yeah. There was the Fukushima at, in Japan. There was a Three Mile Island here in the US. We are talking yeah. over the last 30, 40 years, three incidents. Yep. What exactly went wrong? Was it the nuclear? Was it some human issue? Was it a, a natural calamity of such a proportion that you couldn't imagine? Well, it happened, like the tidal wave hitting uh, Fukushima. Right. So what can we do to deal with it? Why didn't we think of it? Um, so let's have the conversation. It's not like people are saying, this reaction, this process is so safe. Don't worry about it, right? Nobody's saying that. I think that would be the wrong message. The message is, I think, the facts of what did go wrong those three times should be openly discussed. Yeah. Uh, just like every time, you know, once every few years, somewhere ten years, there is a plane crash. We investigate that very carefully and figure out things like. At least one of those crashes is thought to be some terrorist action or something like this, right? Right. What if the engineering technology for a nuclear reactor is absolutely perfect, but somebody does that kind of mischief? Because if you do some damage over there, suddenly it becomes a big dirty, you know, leak of radioactive stuff and so on. So yeah. can, can, you, can, can you tell us that you're going to protect against that and how? People research these things what kind of you know people have attacked nuclear reactors in the past you look in the history books and there have been wars yeah. where people wanted to you know drop something from an aircraft or do something on something like this and uh, did it work what happened some part of it may be classified i don't know but some part is decades later maybe declassified right so i know barely little but just enough to know there's a lot of information out there on the basis of which we can already start doing at least r d to be demonstrated but let the world's experts think it through do tests demonstrations we can test things for 10 years you don't have to go commercial right away you can have a design that's a prototype yeah. Just like the National Executive Pursuit, right? There was some idea 25 years ago, people said, let's try it with lasers. Here we are now. They have 25 years of experience on how to do it. Similarly, if there's some new kinds of nuclear reactor designs or something. Let's build a small one, check it out, learn with it, watch all the little things that can get you this way or that way. Or that way. It should all just be discussed. Let's not say, this will forever be so dangerous that the option should be completely taken off the table. Right. If we do that, I think we are not going to ever get away from fossil fuels. Yeah. Well, the good news is um, nature and the universe has created many large, the largest outputs of energy just from natural yes. Yes. that are that is empowering, utilizing the power of atoms with no sentient being making that happen. And so all we need to do is do is have people like yourself and and other physicists just keep researching, keep trying to understand the the, the particles and the atoms and what's going on in, in the intricacies of quarks and all that stuff. And just um and then once we have that knowledge book, I think we can better start thinking about how to create energy from absolutely. From, 
you know, versus Adams and, and yeah. I think what you what you know you wanting to have this conversation is one of the things that more people should do <laughs> because I think the knowledge book, what is preventing the knowledge book from coming out is that such a book is politically unsafe. Whoever says, let's get the knowledge book written, let's put it out there. Whoever puts their neck on the line to say this, to generate the book and try to make it public. Yeah. The worry is that there will be such a perception backlash that right. you can sort of ruin your career oh, okay. by trying to get the knowledge out there. People will say, my God, how can you possibly talk about these things? This right. thing has to be shut down. And so people say, oops, I don't want to go there because people don't want to hear about it. They're just yeah. getting angry with me if I just talk about the knowledge. Right. So France is 80% nuclear. So there is proof of principle right there that a country of, I don't know, 60 million people in Europe, uh, smart people, uh, old culture, um, has actually figured out how to essentially run their country, which is one fifth the size of the US. It's not a small place, it's a big place. Yeah. 80% uh, nuclear. So why don't people go and find out what's their accident rate? What what, what issues have they had? Right. There's a lot of knowledge base already out there when uh, we don't get to say that in the US. So, And, and of course, a lot of um, the things that we didn't touch upon, but capitalism is also attached to this in the, and I'm a huge fan of capitalism, but the point is corporations, and coal and oil don't want this to happen in their lifetime, sure. which makes sense. They don't want their share price to go down when there's nuclear happening. And, and so uh, France was somehow able to get above that. But obviously, we have a lot of those companies here. So it's, it's they're um, going against that for sure. And yes. That's another attack. Not attack, but that's another element that's... Um, not that understood, but it's definitely happening. I mean, they don't want that to happen. They don't want to not. They love seven. They love fossil fuels. So it's yeah. there's a lot of investment and vested interest in any current technology that you're trying to replace with new technology. Yeah, right. But that tells me that this is not the first time or the second. We are an industrialized country over 100 years. Industrial revolution started happening 150 years ago, and many, many, many times in all of this even in the technology business, even in the computer business or you know, communicate, telecommunication business or anything, high tech business, pharmaceutical business, you name it. New things have disrupted old. Right. So all we have to do is just read hist well-documented, well-researched history. And we've been there before, uh, you know, when fossil fuels started coming out, when cars started coming out, they replaced something else. Then a new car kind of car comes out. I mean, now electric vehicles are going to replace uh, gasoline vehicles. How is that happening? Well, there was one disruptor and others are following and others are following. So, so there are people who have studied how a transition is extremely difficult, technologically difficult and socially, politically difficult. There are vested interests who have an interest in the old way and somebody else wants to bring in the new way. How do these things all work out in the past? We can learn from all those examples. Here is one more example. What are coal burning utilities going to do? Right. Are they themselves going to reinvent into running turbines or running solar plants or running nuclear or something? That's one way to do this, right? You don't have to compete or fight against a new company. Right. Some of these should be, I'm sure they're thinking right now. Take any utility company today, and if they're running a natural gas plant or a coal plant, and they say, 30 years from now, maybe half our electricity production or three-fourths should be coming from what? From wind? Yeah. 
you know, turbine is a turbine. We are yes. running turbines right now in our coal-fired plants. What if we reinvent ourselves as a wind farm company? I see. So you're optimistic that they'll see themselves as an energy company, not a coal company. You know? Yeah, you said it. See yourself as a provider of whatever the consumer wants, not the way it's being produced now. Yeah. That's a secondary issue. You could right. maybe convince the right kind of investors to think that way. Yeah, sure. And sure. then they say, hey, this is not a problem. This is an opportunity. Right. That if we have turbine expertise, we just have to retool from turbines that run on natural gas heating to wind turbine. Okay, what's involved? Okay, we have a 10,000 engineer workforce. Yeah. Spend five years retraining them. We could actually get bigger than we are now. How do you feel about Dyson spheres? Ah, the only thing I've ever seen as a Dyson sphere is a Star Trek show. One right. of the Star Trek episodes. Sure, yeah. In that one, they built a Dyson sphere, which was having a radius like the orbit of the Earth or something. So really, 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 really big Dyson sphere. Yeah. Let me put it this way, quick thought. If we want to harness using the traditional solar panel like way of harnessing solar radiation yeah then you can't get much closer to the sun than that maybe instead of earth's orbit is venus orbit okay but some large orbit because you get much closer than that it gets much much hotter the question is how do we get the power back to the, our planet you know, <laughs> it's a large sphere. So I don't know yeah. how we are going to get enough materials to build a Dyson sphere. Right. That's right. There right. certainly won't be enough iron or aluminum, whatever it is on the earth. Right. I was just at a conference where people are saying the reason to go to the moon is to start mining the moon. The, the reason people are talking about Mars, moon, is not for bringing stuff back to Earth. It's to launch from there further exploration to the next, to the next. Because taking anything that you build on the Earth, lifting it up against the Earth's gravity and take it out there is so expensive, it's completely prohibitive. That we have massive rockets that are lifting 100 kilograms and 500 kilograms. So if you want to build major structures in space, like Dyson Sphere or whatever, you would have to get the material from space. You have to find asteroids out there, which are iron rich or aluminum rich or something, figure out how to mine those. I, I still don't know material you could possibly get from all the asteroids around the sun to build a Dyson Sphere around the sun. I think the right. math doesn't add up. I, I right. Yeah, number. maybe we don't need a Dyson sphere, but I know the natural progression of the civilizations in the universe is probably like using the energy of your planet and then utilizing the energy of your star. So it's just a question: how do we do that most efficient way? And maybe some crazy iteration of a solar panel or solar cell or actual harnessing the power of photosynthesis down to the atomic level in the ten and ten thousand years. Maybe that's where we go. Who knows? But I mean, I you, you can sort of see, I have to you know, ask a technology expert, but you can sort of see that what a solar panel is. A solar panel is mostly silicon, so it's mostly sand and glass. It's all made from sand and glass. Yeah. So, and there's some metal, aluminum, or some copper for conduction, this, that, I'm forgetting some details, I'm sure. Okay. But you could imagine that the solar power you would need to produce solar panels on the moon can all be done on the moon. So you could have a factory that amplifies itself by having some solar panels deployed on the moon. They generate enough energy for you to mine 
Okay. So you could start having a large sonar panel growing, amplifying every year, makes 20% more, 20% more. Uh, and so maybe, who knows, we are talking on the moon, a large self-sustaining and growing solar industry, solar energy production. Yep. Now you can start diversifying the usage of that energy to make other things on the moon. Uh, yep. And now you can start launching. So in this sense, I think solar energy is even easier on other planets than it is on the earth. I mean, here there is clouds and rain, all good stuff, right? We really good <laughs> like that stuff. But these right. desolate planets or rocks like Moon and Mars have no atmosphere, very little atmosphere. So your efficiency of solar is much more stable, predictable. So there is a way to just use tried and tested technologies to improve the efficiency some more, improve the production processes. Maybe robotics are involved in assembling and, and cooking the stuff and so on. And so you can have some automated solar panel deployment and production thing on the moon or on Mars. And, and then that becomes a huge center. So a few people, but many things getting produced from which you can exp the The most important thing is let's not create the kind of environmental mess we created on the Earth which we learned about over right. tens of years. Let's see if we can do it much smarter. You can see that because nobody lives on the moon, it's easy to argue, so what if I create a big waste dump? Nobody cares, there's no humans there. Let's not make that mistake because that's the sort of thing that happened on the earth. People dumped chemical waste here, this kind of that. Ah, uh, what does it matter? You know, nobody's living there, this, that. And eventually something happens and the water leaks in and now you have a, you know, the stuff seeps into water and you have a problem like Flint or something, right? What happened there? It's all kinds of such situations have worldwide. So let, let's do it right. <laughs> so regulations and incentive structures that really says we can do things smartly. We don't have to always just think of the fastest, most expedient, cheapest way of doing it today, which just creates a mess for tomorrow. Right. So here we have to be a little careful with capitalism, just this constant bottom line. Yeah. Do it quick and dirty so I can make more profits today. That's <laughs> the sort of thing we have to be careful about. Yeah. It's the regulations and the general societal uh, let's do it right let's do it right you know it's good it's fine to make a fair profit but don't create a mess for the future in the same time yeah time. that those are the real challenges apart from technology and i feel those are harder to solve than technology we are somehow making more progress with technology than with many of these other things yep yep yeah um that's a great place to leave it good. so i encourage all our viewers think about Like I tell my students, let's not be afraid to think about things. Just because something sounds hard or sounds scary or something doesn't mean it really is. Absolutely. You just have to be willing to think about it, learn about it. And I'm not saying let's just lap it up like believers. Skepticism right. is good. But it's a kind of scientific skepticism that says, I want to learn more. I will ask hard questions. I want answers to my hard questions. I'm going to think about the answers. I think we'll find them.